good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first panel of the Tech and Innovation Summit uh, 2021. Uh, in this session, we are going to look at deep tech and its impact uh, on the future. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, SaaS, cloud, these are possibly uh, omnipresent, but uh, users may not even realize uh, that the ease with which they found a solution on the internet is because of these uh, one of these technologies. And increasingly, uh, these will have more stay and impact on our lives. In this, uh, in this panel, our esteemed speaker will help us understand how the future is going to be shaped by this technology. I'm Saurav Kumar, uh, Editor Special Projects Entrepreneur uh, Media. And with me today, uh, we have Mr. Sokmil Jain, co-founder and CEO of Observe.ai, uh, Ms. Rupan Olak, Managing Director of Pi Ventures, and Mr. Sandeep Bhardava, Managing Director, Asia Pacific and Japan at Raxtex Technology. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. So- uh, Thanks, Arab, good to be here. Thank you so much. So uh, Rupan, I'll start with you. And uh, you know, just on a slight note, as I was mentioning, that recently I've noticed that, you know, as a journalist, most startups, uh, you know, include these words, AI, ML, deepfake, cloud, <laughs> somewhere in their pitch notes. Now, maybe they're just using it, uh, you know, deep tech service somewhere in the <clears> system. <throat> so have you also noticed the same? And if so, why is it, uh, why is it so? Is it because it's uh, inward right now? And, you know, how do you as an investor se separate, you know, what is greed and what is sharp? Sure, Saurabh. Uh, first of all, thanks. Yeah, I think it's a very pertinent question. And uh, to address this, let me first tell you a little bit about Pi Ventures. So we are uh, a deep tech fund. So we have actually since 2017 been investing in AI led companies. And over time, we've also started looking at other forms of deep tech innovation. Uh, so this context is important because we are a specialized fund, right? So we understand AI. So to your point, yes, over the last few years, uh, you know, when we felt we were sort of like the pioneers in AI and we, used to see a few companies uh, in AI, but over the last two, three years, it's like every pitch deck has AI in it or other deep tech mentioned, right? So it's it has become sort of like a buzzword. I think the trick here is to understand, uh, first thing, what is the problem being solved? And is AI really needed for it, right? So it's not needed for everything. Of course, you can really uh, bring in a lot of efficiency, scale and other advantages using AI. But uh, what's important to understand is how this technology is solving the problem that the startup is claiming to solve and is it really necessary? So that's the first level of understanding that one needs to have. Next is, I think as a, you know, since we've met so many companies, we know how to, uh, let's say, uh, you know, separate uh, we from the shaft and be able to understand the nitty gritty. So, and we do that by peeling layers, trying to understand at a high level, what are the kind of models being used? What are the kind of architectures being used? So you get to understand a little bit from those discussions, how much, where exactly AI is being used and how much is actually being used and how much does the founder really know about it? So that's the approach that we have and we do have an advantage there. But for anyone else who probably doesn't have that advantage, for them to understand whether, you know, the whatever is being claimed in the pitch deck is actually true or not. There are a couple of ways in which one can actually, let's say, hack uh, and understand. Uh, so one would be to look at the background of the founders or let's say the founding team and understand where all you know people have actually used AI in their past experiences and whether that was a critical role. So that's something, uh, you know, is certainly can be helpful. Second way of uh, understanding that is just talking to experts and, uh, you know, external experts, because now there are a lot of people both in academia as well as, you know, in the industry who understand AI pretty well. So there, that's another way of just reaching out, getting help from people to understand uh, uh, whether AI is actually being used. But to and your what, point, yes. And what about uh, ordinary layman consumers like me? How do we, like someone say that, you know, we're offering an AI-based solution, an ML-based solution. How do I, what do I do? I mean, do I go to you? Do I ask for a Do I ask Sandeep? What do I do? 
as a consumer you don't need to understand as a consumer it doesn't matter what's in there right as a consumer you need to understand that your problem is being solved whether it is being solved or not is what is critical and whether it is easy the product that you are being sold is that easy for you to use or not that's all what is uh you know making this possible the engine at the back is i mean not a, not the consumer's problem so uh, you know uh, something uh, rupan said that uh, uh, you know uh, they look at whether ai is uh, required to solve a problem or not and you provide the solution so do you how do you uh, determine that you know whether if someone's approached you whether you really require it or not because your business requirement requirement would say okay let's give him a solution you know for whatever he needs but that not may not be needed so do you ask him that you don't really need it or you customize it how do you how do you decide on where to uh, you know implement your solution you know absolutely um, and i think uh, rupan put it in the right way which is go with the problem not with the solution um, so what's happening these days um, saurav is you know at the end of the day like you know when we talk about technologies right uh, technology is a means to an end right where, where people confuse is hey me telling you that i am an ai company doesn't really do much versus i would rather get and you will get you will also get a lot more value if i told you you know what problem i'm solving right versus saying like yeah hey, i'm a saas company i'm a cloud company i mean aws company doesn't really matter to you you're like okay sure you might be deployed on aws or you might be deployed on gcp who cares right it doesn't really matter to you uh, so going back to you know how we make sure that you know we are using ai when it's needed is we always have this five why process in the company right whenever someone comes with a with us uh, with any idea or any approach like hey let's do this right there's a natural tendency and this is this is human so there's a natural tendency for us to talk about ideas and solutions uh, and less about problems right so we start working backwards from there the first question we ask is like why do we need to solve this problem and then you keep peeling back uh, to five why's and you will get to a stage where we start talking about the problem right instead of saying hey let's build a great model which detects sentiment from the speech you start working back backwards to what user problem and then what business problem does it even solve or it doesn't even solve and when you do this exercise you realize you, do you even need to build something that's number one uh, and then if you need to build something do you actually need ai or you know someone started with ai because that was really cool so i think the five by process is something that we use at observe to make sure you know we don't focus on um, you know humans always start at the rear end so features and and functionalities um, and and we work backwards from five wise to get to the problem of it all right so we don't we don't become a company which uses ai as a hammer and they're trying to find nails uh, versus we, we work backwards which is like hey, we have we have this problem it could be a nail it could be a you know screw it could be something and then we find the right solution so that's that's how we at observe make sure that we don't end up uh, using using ai for everything when it doesn't even matter and uh, uh, sandeep coming to you you know apart from the, these uh, these words like ai ml robotics is another word which uh, you know we i often come across is cloud based solution and uh, we have integrated so uh, from uh, you, you uh, so the same question do you also you know kind of uh, see these uh, uh, words being used or they are actually being deployed and they are actually required to be uh, deployed to for uh, for any uh, problem to be solved for any company to maybe move to the next level so actually you know we've been we've been in the industry now for 23 years and we kind of created the, the whole web hosting category and we've seen the startups kind of you know move through the value chain right um and you know it kind of tells me tells my age but 10 years ago i was in a symposium where this person said let me start with mainframe and then mainframe to client server architecture right but that's that really stuck with me because you know the way the person was talking about and he was coming to a particular point in time of of a particular technology that you know in the same way you can uh, start thinking about the evolution of cloud right uh, so people talk about being on cloud especially uh, you know if you are a younger company i wouldn't even say younger company but you know even the whole there is another buzzword that has got created which is digital native and every company wants to be digital native right but the most traditional of companies want to call themselves digital native right and and one part of that is are we are we cloud based right at the end of the day 
it is really about the customer problems that you are trying to solve, the kind of applications that you're using, and hence the underlying infrastructure that you need, right? Um, hey, quite a number of companies still host their infrastructure on mainframe. You know, we thought 10, 15 years ago that mainframes would die, but mainframes still exist and the sales are still growing, right? They're not going anywhere, right? Uh, it could be that, it could be any other high performance compute solutions, or it could be more and more, it could be a cloud-based solution from one of the hyperscalers, right? And of course, cloud-based solutions, you know, have the advantage, and Swapnil would know this, he can put in his credit card, spin up an environment, and off he goes. You know, I started my life as a SAP consultant, and I remember that every time we had a new project, we had to wait for three months, because we would wait for the server to come in, and then everything to be built up. These days, you know, in eight hours, you can get the environment set up and then you can start doing what you need to do. So the time to outcomes has become much, much faster in the world of cloud, right? And in the way you use technologies. And that's why everybody wants to say that they are cloud ready or they are hosted on cloud. But there is of scenarios out there that are using a lot of other technologies, right? Uh, so. It's, it's really the kind of problems that you're trying to solve and hence the kind of underlying infrastructure you need that really determines what is the right solution for you. It might be a cloud from one of the three or four or five hyperscalers now, like if you count the Chinese ones, uh, or it could be still that old mainframe on your data center. Any trend that you've observed in the in this adoption in the Especially in the past two years, when we were stuck with, uh, you know, when the pandemic started, because, you know, everyone knows that everyone's digital transformation plans have been, you know, brought forward by ages. So, uh, have you seen any change, distinctive change, uh, especially regarding to any particular sector where you have seen something that, uh, you know, they have started adopting more and more of these uh, uh, solutions? Actually, I would say, you know, the change is across sectors. Uh, so, you know, uh, there, there were people who were very attached to their data centers because that is one thing that they could point and say, in this company, in IT, I own this data center. There is, there is that space, there is the power and cooling, right? And, and people could touch and feel, right? And there were a number of customers, especially in India, who said, you keep talking to sir, us, sir, about cloud, but can you touch and feel it? I have this, I have this plot of land that if nothing else remains, at least this plot of land will be mine, right? That mode has changed across the, com uh, the country, right? As people have not been able to reach to that, those plot of land to do the things that they wanted to do. Uh, and people have started realizing how easy and simple it is uh, to operate you know, on one of the hyperscaler platforms, that that barrier has really gone down significantly, right? Uh, now, of course, you know, the regulatory environment still has to catch up. Uh, so there are still industries where, you know, data privacy, data security, compliance, governance are still big issues. And, and so people are still reluctant, though they're trying, but they're still reluctant to move to, you know, public cloud platform. Uh, but even there, the barriers have got lowered, uh, you know, because of what people have seen over. So I wouldn't, I, you know, I wouldn't say, and it's one particular industry, and it's, you know, it's a transformation that you see across industries that is also driving up the skill shortage because suddenly you need so many people in that skill set that all around the world that you're seeing that shortage and, and you're seeing that shortage in India as well. Yeah, yeah we are seeing the shortage and we're seeing the kind, of, uh, the kind of things people are doing to attract talent right now in India. That's crazy. I mean, offering guides to holidays and everything. So, uh, 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 Rupan, I'll come to you. Uh, you know, Sandeep just said that uh, you know it's across the sector where you know this adoption is uh, going up. So, and uh, that, uh, but there are regulatory hurdles still that needs to be taken care of before we really, before any small company, large company, whoever thinks about doing this. What, what has been your experience? Do, do you really see companies which are which do have a solution, but still are reluctant because they, they think that there could be this regulatory hurdle or there could be these problems they might face. Yeah, so that sort of totally depends on the industry, the sector itself. 
So uh, if we talk about enterprise sector, right? So there's so much of uh, acceleration of transformation, digital transformation that has happened, but no real regulatory hurdle except for making sure that you know you're adhering to privacy related compliances regulations and all localization localization all those things but uh, uh, which are let's say i mean still in progress but more or less uh, standardized right so today you can go for certain certifications wherein you can claim that you know the data is safe or you know the security everything the frameworks are being adhered to Right, so that's from the enterprise perspective. But if we look at other sectors, for example, healthcare, right, their regulatory challenge, of course, becomes more important, especially if you want to go global. In India, it's a, uh, it's still something that, you know, people can commercialize their products. Uh, you know, if they have, uh, let's say, uh, a no, um, a no objection certificate from the government, but if if they have to uh, target the global market, then it becomes very difficult because you have to go through the CE or FDA approval, which actually also has, uh, you know, become much more streamlined. And let's say the process has in itself become much easier and quicker than what it would have been, you know, pre-COVID days. So that acceleration has happened even from the regulatory front. So, uh, so just going a little bit deeper into, let's say, uh, a case like healthcare. So therein, you know, you see a transformation both from what the companies are offering to what the consumers are ready to try and uh, adopt. So pre-COVID, uh, there was a lot of hesitation towards going for online consultations or, let's say, prioritizing your health. But now all that all that has changed because. Uh, we see a lot of telehealth platforms that have uh, come up and are becoming very successful. There is a growing need for telereporting wherein you know, a doctor doesn't have to be present in person to be able to come up with a report or certify a report. And all this is being uh, you know, enabled by deep tech. So technologies uh, which are not just, you know, of course, cloud and everything really is important but also being able to digitize, let's say if it's pathology, being able to digitize the slide so that a pathologist, pathologist who's sitting in a remote area is able to uh, come up with a diagnosis. So those are the things that are happening. And there's uh, also from consumer perspective, a lot of focus on wellness. And that's why you have a lot of these companies that are doing fairly well in terms of both fitness, nutrition, and all the preventative healthcare uh, angle. So, so yes, there has been a very good, uh, uh, let's say, um, push for uh, you know transformation in uh, healthcare as well as other sectors. And regulatory will continue to be a little bit of a challenge in these sectors, but we are seeing really good progress from that angle as well. So, so uh, you operate from uh, you know so. Do you think these are problems specifically for uh, uh, for this geography, or do you think it's easier to operate from there and then enter this geography? How do you, how, what do you think? About it? Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll caveat that answer sort of by saying that we don't yeah, have yeah. too much experience selling into it in the Indian market. Yeah, um, yeah. So, but I can give you perspective on the on selling into the US market. Uh, so similar to Indian market, right? The US market, you don't have a lot of hesitance on you know cloud. Um, right, some of the big banks like Capital One is actually one of the biggest customer of AWS, right, uh, out there. Uh, one of the biggest streaming services out there, Netflix is built on AWS, right? Dropbox used to be built on AWS. So the US market has seen a lot of, uh, I would say, sensitive industries such as banking, healthcare, um, you know, data uh, in terms of Dropbox being on cloud, right? So people here and businesses here understand that uh, cloud is safe, cloud is secure. Uh, cloud provides high SLA. Uh, so people here understand a lot more than uh, than I would say maybe in India. Uh, it's my guess. Uh, but so US, you don't see hesitation so much of, you know, on-premise versus the cloud. But that being said, you still have to go through a bunch of certifications, right? So if you're selling into the healthcare market, you have to make sure, you know, let's just focus on the US market for a bit, uh, that you have to go through HIPAA compliance, you are HIPAA compliant, um, you know, you have to deal with... Uh, if you're, if you're dealing with medical records, uh, you have to be extra careful around them. Uh, and then when we're selling to these customers, one of the things we see is they require us to make sure that none of our employees outside of US access this data, 
right? So there's two parts to so data residency, which is they require the data to stay in the US servers. And then also no one can outside of US can access this data, um, right? So, so while the people here, you know, are a lot more open to cloud, um, you know, the, the regulatory bodies have done a good job of like, you know, if you want to sell, sell in healthcare, go and make sure you have HIPAA. If you want to sell in financial services, make sure you have SOC 2 and you have, uh, uh, you have ISO 27001 and you are ready for that, right? If you want to go into uh, outside, if you're going to go into Europe, you have GDPR ready and your data residency in the Europe. So I think there's, as I think Rupan mentioned this, you have these certifications and compliances that you can, you can get which allows you to seamlessly sell into sell into the US market. So we have not run into too much hesitance. I would say the cloud versus on-premise in the US uh, until now. Okay. Sandeep, what do you think? It, it, it's, uh, you know, Sapni said that US is not that hesitant. So in this part of the geography, do you think it's more lack of understanding or it is uh, the uh, regulatory issues that uh, really uh, affects the growth or, or I would say adoption? Yeah, so you know, uh, look, I'm I'm based out of Singapore, and I've I kind of sell all across Asia. Um, right. uh, in India specifically, you know, I would say about two three years ago, the hesitancy was more around latency, um, you know, network connectivity, uh, you know, like I said, attachment to your own data center or your and your own kit uh, right next to you. Uh, but in the last twelve months. Uh, 18 months, and especially, you know, with um, the kind of, uh, I would say, entrepreneurship activity um, that has happened in India, right? Uh, the number of uh, unicorns that have emerged, uh, the number of companies, right? I see a lot more activity um, around people uh, adopting public cloud, and that, that goes across uh, and they're using use cases, even, even regulatory industries, even bank, like, you know, uh, have kind of rewritten applications, not gone, gone with package application, rewritten an app for their own need, um, which is getting hosted on cloud, right? Uh, one of the famous banks in India have, have the whole CRM system, uh, which is not a package software. So, so there is, you know, I've, at least I've seen in the last 12 to 18 months, I've seen quite a bit of traction in India in the public cloud space. Right, uh, uh, and I would say that some of the same factors that were there in India are also applicable in, let's say, Southeast Asia, where a number of countries have the challenge on around data sovereignty because not each country has data centers, right, and, and data connectivity. But slowly, as you know, as hyperscalers kind of invest money uh, and take care of those technical challenges, more and more those barriers are getting, you know, lower. Uh, you know, the one one big example is as as Google set up its uh, instance in Indonesia, we've seen some of the largest customers uh, starting to adopt. And Amazon is a bit behind, but they are also trying to catch up and create an instance. And that is, you know, and you can see Indonesia where, and I've done Indonesia for 15 years, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have thought that Indonesians would adopt cloud, but you can see that there is definitely a large, large traction. So... So those barriers to entry uh, for, for, for using public cloud is dropping in all the major markets in Asia back. Uh, I have one question. Uh, if, you, if you choose, you can say not to answer it, but you know, Swapni, you just talked about data residence. The term here in India is localization. How are these two different? If, if US is saying that residence is put together and India is saying it has to be localized. What is the difference? Uh, anyone can be from India. Anyone can be I think it's the same, right, Swapta? It's, I, I it's... believe so. I mean, I, we understand data residency because that's what you know our customers say. Uh, and you know, this is this is pretty famous, especially after after you know Europe launched GDPR, and then California here in, in Bay Area launched uh, launched CCPA, the California Privacy Act. So that, that's what we hear, like, you know, data, data residency, where is your data resident? I believe, I think what you're referring to sort of is the same thing, which is like, if you have the data for the Indian consumers, um, so you want to make sure it is in it. India. Yeah, it, it, should not be accessible. it should not be accessible from anywhere else. That Correct. would be, yeah. that would be. Yeah. yeah, and I think uh, this is what, this was the whole fight, you know, that, uh, that Indian government was, was going on with Twitter, right? Like, you know, making sure the data for the Indian consumers is side, um, inside, uh, inside India. 
and i think that that gets really tricky if you're a global business and you're a global global provider right you're twitter or facebook um and for companies like this making sure that the data for india is in india and and the other data outside the us and and all the processing happens in india it just gets harder and harder uh, with with more more countries but i think it's the same term uh, sarav i believe so uh, rupan i'll come to you and you know i will there are some questions that have come so while you know the uh, while we speak i'll take some questions related question i had uh, you know i want to ask uh, rupan that you know with all these uh, like we heard we just uh, talked about residency thing and the plantation and the uh, you know this deep tech coming into probably everything health tech banking everywhere uh, does it really uh, you know uh, uh it, 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 is it uh, like you know, our privacy somehow you think uh, is a is a thing which at least here in india we still have not been able to address to our laws maybe or to our technology so uh, there are still uh, there are there's still some way to go ahead before we ensure that we we, we hear about you know these data being used to your banking data from some startups uh, you know uh, uh, system we had what do we i mean do you think it's infringing so uh, short answer it's work in progress i think we've made a lot of progress but we are not there yes today as a consumer i have no idea where all my data is sitting to be honest right uh, it's in apps that uh, you know maybe i'm using it's probably also in some applications which i probably used so many years ago and it's still there right all the gdpr and all those compliances require give you the right to be able to you know that right to forget and all but we don't know who's exercising that who's complying with that right so yes uh, there is infringement of data that is happening and uh, i think what's important is to have certain regulations and laws in place which ensure that the data privacy is held without compromising on the startup's progress right it should not be like or let's say any company right today you do need data to be able to make progress right you need to be able to get to certain insights which you would not if you don't understand your customer well enough uh, but what we've seen so far the way the laws uh, the you know the certain bills have been written is is just way too stringent and could really hamper uh, you know startups utilizing the data in a in a uh, you know in a good way in a beneficial way so there is a balance that needs to be uh, you know built in from the government side it should not be there's nothing in place it's free for all versus you know just becoming too much of a watchdog on uh, technology or innovation with the uh, data being you know the uh, scapegoat so to speak uh so yeah we are still i think making a lot of progress but yet to get to that holy grail and uh, to be honest we also see a lot of uh, deep tech startups that are targeting this problem right from data privacy perspective so a lot of companies are working towards ensuring that uh within the organization companies are complying with these rulings so that's that's also helping okay Okay, let me put this put it this way, and uh, you know, whoever wants to answer. So you said that we are working progress. So there are two ways to go about it. One is that we are working progress. So let's have very stringent rules right now, and let's see that what passes the passes muster, and then it becomes the norm. Or we let it very loose and let everyone do whatever they want, and there is a mess created, and then we kind of funnel then try to you know have a top down approach. What which one do you think is better? I mean, which 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 would work better especially for 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 india you know for people are still not uh, still do not understand uh, where they are sharing their data uh, and how can they be uh, uh, you know where uh, where it can get get compromised oh, yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. so let me just quickly uh, re sort of like reiterate what i said so i would go for the balance and you know uh, there's always when there's something new that's happening there's always a lot of pain there's a lot of uh, uh, let's say flux 
before we get to a stage where everything is streamlined. So unfortunately, I think we are going through that fluidic situation right now. In a couple of years or so, we will get to a stage where things are streamlined and everyone knows what needs to be done. So I would say this is a temporary phase, but balance is where what I would aim for. What do you think? I mean, I think we have extreme examples, right? So I'll, I'll give you an example of US and China. Uh, so so the, whole, you know, the whole data play um, and how, how consumers' data could be leveraged by businesses um, to either provide them ads, to provide them recommendations, to either sell their data, to resell the data, uh, and a bunch of other things that could be done with the data set, right? Um, if you look at US stand, right? US stand has been, because the rules and, and, and compliance set is a lot more clear, U.S. rules are more on the stringent side, right? Like, you know, consumers have a lot more control over data, around data privacy. Uh, I, I see Sandeep smiling because I think even, even, the, even the U.S. Uh, stringent laws are not stringent enough with, 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 the, with the amount of data that is further being generated by more and more sensors and, and the devices you're using, right? Um, so, so even in the U.S., right, even with stringent law, is a work in progress. For example, like you have now an IoT-driven microwave. What happens with that data? Like, where is that data going? You have an IoT-driven fridge that is generating data about you know, what, what's inside the fridge, let's say, uh, and is understanding what you buy. Where does that data go? Who controls that? Who has access to it? What, what can the fridge manufacturer do with that data? You're running into all of these challenges because you know, uh, there's, there's so much data that is being generated because all of these sensors around humans, and obviously phone is getting more and more um, sophisticated and you're getting more sensors there. But going back quickly, so US was always on the stringent side. You know, consumers and businesses have, businesses have a lot more, um, they've had to provide a lot more clarity. Consumers have a lot more control. And what it, what it meant was, and I think this, this is what maybe Ruben was, um, was sharing about is, this is, this is not so great for AI companies because AI companies, the foundation of AI is data, right? You learn based on data. You need a lot of data uh, to build the initial models to even get into the market. So if, if, if you are so restricted that you can't buy data, I'm using, using the word buy here, but you can't, you can't store data, you can't buy data, you, can, you can't build to, use it to build models, you have a problem. But if you look at what China did, China went on the extreme side, like no laws, right? Like no, no crazy, no, I shouldn't say crazy, but like no privacy stringent laws. You could use as much data you want. And that's where you saw everything around like you know, facial detection and, and face detection technologies for different use cases. And, and, and it has both, you, you see both, both sides of it, right? So on China, on the other side, went uh, on, on, on the other extreme, right? Which is, hey, use as much data you want for whatever use case that you want. We don't really care so much about it. Now, the positive side of that is when, when, you, when you leave it sort of the way you were describing, like open for all, it leads to a lot of innovation, right? Because people have so much data. Now imagine all the amazing innovative applications that, that could be built on top of this. But at the same time, you have the challenge of, this data could be misused, right? This data could be abused uh, for use cases that, that are not uh, you know, good for everyone out there, right? So that's sort of like the US and the China version. And then India, you know, we heard Rupan, I think the, the compliance and, and government and regulatory bodies are still catching up with what, what is even going on here, right? You know, what kind of data is being collected? How is it being used? I think in my mind, India and Indian regulatory bodies are not even up to speed on what data, how data, why data, I, I don't think we are there yet. Um, and, and, you know, I think US has been taught a lot with, with companies like Google, right? Like they were the first one, you know, at a, at a mass scale to say, I'm going to, I'm going to use all this data for advertisement, right? And then more and more ads like Facebook and, and now people understand, okay, data being used to sell you more stuff or to show you recommendations. I think India is not there yet in terms of even knowing what is going on with my data. Um, so I feel it will take some time for India to catch up on, you know, Having having clear guidelines and and policies and compliance on on consumer privacy laws. As if I was not too scared of my phone, and now you have made me scared that my refrigerator data is also with someone. They know what butter I'm using, what bread I'm using, right? This this is the new thing, sort of. I think you know, unfortunate or fortunate, whatever. I think you want convenience, right? You want to top your fridge. Uh, you want to talk to your microwave. You you want sensors uh, all around you. I mean, this this is the world we are living in. I think. I think there, there, is, there is data, uh, on an average, I think you have like 10 to 12 devices per person at home these days, like Alexa, Google Home, fridge sensors, TV sensors, your Wi-Fi, your router. Air conditioners. 
air conditioner and then now we have this uh, this uh, zumba which runs with wi-fi connected it's like yeah, so we are, we are living in this world where like everything is in is every i would I, every device that we use is is internet connected and it is generating data uh, and storing data uh, hearing hearing all day seeing so there's data everywhere and if you uh, you were you were you were you, you were smiling when you were speaking about these things uh, i was you know um but you know we have three we have three different models like we have the us which kind of started you know uh, in a bit loser manner but the rules of the game were pretty much kind of set over a period of time um but still supports its companies you know uh, wholeheartedly and then you have europe which is gone really really privacy and privacy first uh, and then china which kind of allowed everything and now is reining back in and is realizing the problems that happen when you start to rein back in right um i uh when not that i have any influence on any regulatory body i would like for india i would prefer that we kind of go in you know a little bit of the china approach a little bit of like you have to let the innovation happen you have to let the innovation you know you have to let people kind of build things and then you learn along the way and you figure out which ones you control and how you control them right rather than putting those controls and then giving it in the hands of the bureaucrats and the judiciary and then stifling up uh, you know competition right i would rather the competition is out there and then you learn along the way right a little bit like like artificial intelligence you slowly learn what rules you should put in okay. so we we'll, uh, we have a question for uh, for the, uh, our audience and ruben this is uh, this one's for you uh, what are what are the trends that you are seeing in india indian tech community around clean tech uh, beyond carbon capture do you see new trends around capturing measuring uh, emission and footprint via iot and ai uh, what would you uh, what would be your take back on this area yeah so clean tech i think it's a very broad subject and there are like so many uh, let's say subsectors around it so the kind of innovation that we are seeing in clean tech uh, so far in india is a lot of is a lot of it focused of course on the ev side uh ev infrastructure side rapid charging because those are the main bottlenecks that are uh, hampering the adoption of evs uh the other thing that we are seeing is battery innovation so today we have a lot of dependence on certain raw materials which we don't have let's say supply chain control over we seen so many companies that are coming up uh, with alternate bio degradable materials or materials that are easily available in india it's so a lot of innovation happening there then uh, uh i think also on power uh, uh power drives for evs uh because they're very different from what uh, an ic engine would have and uh, uh also we seeing in waste management which is also under climate change we seeing robotics companies that are coming up that are looking at sorting out waste at source without a human today if you you know today a human has to separate the wet waste from dry waste and dry waste actually both of them have a lot of value but how do you do the segregation in an automated fashion so very interesting companies coming up with robotic solution that can do that so very broad uh, spectrum of technologies and applications within climate change uh, yeah climate tech that we are seeing completely agree. i think the segregation of dry and wet has been one of the biggest challenges for energy to waste plan absolutely uh, you know in india which which we have not been able to take off because of any exactly. solutions like those come in uh, i think that could be yes uh, another question that uh, we have uh, is uh, for the For the agri-tech, is it possible to teach AI and ML to the grassroots level since our farm size is too small, or is it a far cry? Right? Uh, anyone talking? Do you think uh, you know for small agri-tech uh, people having a small business, they can integrate AI? Yes, sir. I'm I'm not able to hear you well. I think if I understand the question correctly, are you referring to use AI in agri? Yeah, in or... small agri-tech, agri-tech. Uh, mm-hmm. but, uh, Yeah, I think you know uh, one. I I don't have too much experience into that market, so please take that with a grain of salt. But 
from whatever um, I'm aware of, there are applications being built. Uh, I can use some of the examples of what's being done already in the US, right? So from drone monitoring, where you try to understand, you know, what, what stage your crops are, and is it a time to harvest, is it a time to seed, is it a time to, uh, you can understand, uh, you, can, you can detect, pre-detect insects being created by understanding the texture, by understanding the size of your soil. So there are lots of innovation already happening that I'm aware of. But I think I would actually ask Rupan. She might be yeah. seeing a lot more than. And yeah, she I might think have we have companies ideas. which are into these. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Sapnil, you got it right. So, there's a lot of uh, technologies that are being used for making agri tech, you know, agriculture, let's say improving the yield, uh, reducing the cost, and, uh, you know, a lot of startups and some successful startups. But the challenge is, of course, like you rightly, it's there in the question itself that for in India, the land holding is much smaller, right? So the business model in India is what has been, let's say, the challenge to crack. So who's going to pay for all this? Yes, farmers will be happy. There is a little bit of a change in, let's say, the behavior for them to adopt these technologies. But beyond that, who's going to pay for it, right? So uh, so that's been the key challenge, at least from what we've been seeing in uh, this space. But there are alternate models, for example, let's say uh, the, uh, the input providers, for example, the fertilizer companies, the seed companies, because they want to promote their products. So they end up being the source of monetization for some of these startups or let's say insurance companies. Yeah. Right. So I was those about the insurance. Yeah. It sounds a lot like, you know, it's like vaccines, right? Insurance companies want you to have vaccines so you don't fall sick and you don't the insurance company doesn't have to pay. So it's a lot like if I give you these tools to have better yield, you're not gonna come back and ask for the insurance money. So uh, that's a good one. Yeah. So on this side, yes, a lot of technology, but business model is something that needs a little bit maturing up, I think. Yeah. Maybe we if you want to add something. No, no, just okay. that. The so, business uh, models are the problem. Yes, I, but you know, Rupan has said we are working for this, so you know, we'll be there. So, this question, one last question, I think, before we move to the awards. Uh, I think, Sandeep, for you, uh, how can companies storing and using data uh, be made accountable by consumers and businesses and not only by law? Uh, see, as consumers, all of us, you know, uh, vote with our choices, right? Um, uh, you know, we, we always have the choice of using or not using the app, uh, right? You know, uh, now, of course, people like Apple have shown that if you take it to the next level and give people the actual choice of not allowing the companies to track, there are a lot of us will not allow the companies to track, right? So, so in that case, the platform per se also has a role to play, as you know, as Apple has shown. Uh, but apart from that, you know, apart, you know, unless you you talk about law, as as a consumer, you know, I can choose which applications I use on my phone. You know, which keyboards do I allow to be inserted on my phone, right? Or how do I secure um, knowing, you know? what some of these things are doing, right? Uh, we all use application which kind of tell our future or tell five characteristics about us. They're all reading our data, right? Uh, and it is a known fact. Uh, people still like it. And and so this is a conversation that I have I had with my relatives, with my friends. Uh, the younger generation believes our data is already out. That train is already passed. The conversation that we're having is a very old generation conversation and do whatever, right? Let's enjoy life as is. Uh, and then there are people who are very, very privacy conscious, uh, but, you know, but in the end, it's the only choice that they have is really how to make sure that the data is not being unfairly used around them. <laughs> uh, you know, I would love to go on, uh, on and on, but, you know, we have time restriction, but you talked about Apple, Sandeep, and Apple is an expensive phone, you know, the, the Indians use smaller smartphones and the applications we don't really have those so maybe we are the test cases from where this everything is being taken and then you know uh, a better product is made uh, so as you said the train has already passed maybe it's a whole generation talking to it but as Rupan said that you know it's work in progress 
and uh, you know we'll be there some, something and so as uh, you know something said that there is a us model and a china model for use of uh, you know stringent laws so where india should be and we think it should be china maybe someone thinks it should be uh, the other way now but uh, yes eventually together uh, uh, with the uh, innovations more and more innovations coming in i'm sure that we will be able to overcome these you know, uh, so thank you sandeep thank you sabin thank you